and Magli also positioned Christie's hands on a slab and hit it with hammer. They then used sharp kitchen utensils to make cuts all over his body and then used a pair of pliers to mutilate one of his ears. Then Eric used a metal bar, a dumbbell and a chisel to knock out Christie's teeth. I don't understand how knocking out someone's teeth reads the person of evil spirits or demons. This guy Eric was the real witch judging from the things that he did to that young boy. What he did was just straight off hench. The thing I don't understand most is that the signs that they say are indications of the possessions are simple things like bedwetting, nails biting, stealing of petty items including food, erasers, even pencils were said to be signs of kindoki possessions. And this is really sad because a lot of children bet wet and bite their nails and take things that aren't theirs. Does that mean they are possessed by demons and evil spirits? I just don't understand. It all began at Christmas of 2010. Christian Bamo, who was 15 years old at the time, and four of his siblings left Paris to London to visit their older sister, Magali, who lived in New High London with her fiancé, Eric Bikubi. Little did they know that soon after they arrived, they would be branded witches and asked to fly out of a window of a high-rise building. And when they couldn't, they were beaten and tortured in an exorcism that left one of them deceased. We are getting into this case right away, but before then, kindly show support by subscribing to my channel and give this video a thumbs up. I would really appreciate if you do that. Thank you so very much. Now, on February the 21st of 1983, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I think then it was known as Desire, Magali Bamo was born to her parents, Pierre and Jacqueline Bamo. The family then moved to Paris when Magali was just, you know, like five years old. Pierre needed to flee the regime and the war in Congo at the time, so they chose France to move to. Pierre was a very skilled man, so to make money, you know, to take care of his family, he opened a carpentry business, designing and manufacturing furniture for hotels, restaurants and offices. Business was good, but for some reason, the Bamo family could not just settle down. They moved from place to place. And by 1996, Pierre again moved himself and his wife back to the country, that is, back to Congo. You know, he wanted to start his carpentry business, then he wanted to establish his business there. And 13 year old Magali was left to live with her mother's niece, Phoebe, and her husband, Ferdinand, in Dagenham, East London where she was treated very horribly. They basically treated her like she was some type of slave that they had gotten. They didn't treat her like she was even related to them. You know what I mean? She was just a child, but she did all the house chores. You know, she was denied food and was stabbed so many times. And often she was beaten whenever she ate. Instead of being corrected, she was severely beaten. Magali suffered through all of this until she became an adult. And later on in life, she met Eric Bikubi through a mutual friend and the two hit it off instantly. Before this, Magli was making something out of her life, you know. She had been a receptionist at some point. Then she also got work as a dental nurse all before she met Eric Bikubi. Eric himself was a football coach. He wasn't doing bad at all. He was doing quite okay, you know. He planned to open up a soccer academy in the future. When the two met, the relationship started off very great. Everything seemed to be, you know, on point. They were a nice couple who understood each other. But all of that did not last very long because soon enough, Eric began to show his true colors as time progressed in the relationship. So Eric at some point became extremely controlling. You know, he was verbally abusive and super manipulative. And he began to dictate what Magali should be and how she should live her life. Eric refused to let her wear makeup, basically. He even refused to let her go anywhere by herself without him, not even to go see some of her friends whom she knew way before she even met him. He would call her names and express to her how stupid and foolish she was and practically just basically tear her down as a person. And all of these actions had an effect on Magali. She, at some point, you know, began to believe that she was worthless. And that's one thing that happens with abuse. When the abuser constantly keeps telling you that you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, you are all that, 
it comes at a point that you start believing it and that was what Magali did. Magali was going through all of this but she hid it even from her own parents who knew Eric. They saw him like a son and they never imagined that he could be abusing their daughter but behind closed doors Eric was a really terrible person. Eric Bikubi was also originally from the Congo. He was born in Congo in 1983. His mother passed away giving birth to him, so he grew up with his father alone, basically. Now, throughout Eric's life, his father, who was a good trader, taught him about a type of witchcraft called Kindoki. So this type of witchcraft was widely believed in the Congo to be responsible for child possession. So what happens is when a child is pointed out as being possessed by either religious leaders or an elder, I can't really explain in details all that goes on into identifying someone possessed by demons as believed in the Congo. It's a whole world out there for people who believed in Kendoki. Feel free to look into this if you want to know more about this sort of witchcraft called Kindoki. But as soon as a child is pointed out, steps will be taken to rid the child of the evil spirit and the demons that was possessing them. And this will usually be a form of, a lot of activities basically like a form of exorcism is performed, which included beatings, salvation submissions, water deprivations, which basically leads to dehydration and continuous prayers without food. How can one friend human being endure all of this? I mean, this is way too much for a child to endure. No matter how you look at it, a young human is being tortured in order to free them of evil spirits because someone out there said that they were possessed. The way this is justified is that during the possessions, this evil spirit has taken over the possessed, so they are unable to feel the pain from the horrible mutilations and the beatings and the torture that they are being subjected to and only the evil spirits feel the pain, which is obviously not the case. It takes common sense to know this, right? That when a human being is beaten, they physically feel the pain. It's not the spirits that feel the pain. People feel pain when they are being tortured physically. The thing I don't understand most is that the signs that they say are indications of the possessions are simple things like bedwetting, nails biting, stealing of petty items, including food, erasers, even pencils were said to be signs of kindoki possessions. And this is really sad because a lot of children bet wet and bite their nails and take things that aren't theirs. Does that mean they are possessed by demons and evil spirits? I just don't understand. Having been taught about Kendoki from a young age, Eric had it embedded in his mind and throughout his relationship with Magali, Eric would talk about the visions that he as a child was having like seeing rats that were never there. He was the only one who was vividly seeing the rats. Nobody else was seeing it. I believe having heard about witchcraft for so long, it became a part of his subconscious. I mean, his father told him so much about Kendoki and so did his uncle who later became his guardian. So Eric and his uncle fled Congo in 1990 when he was just seven years old to escape the war there and you know the regime at that time. So they settled in London and his uncle would talk more with him about Kindoki again and witchcraft and sorcery before he passed away after contracting HIV. It's like the uncle just picked up from where Eric's father left off. I mean, why did they see the need to feed him so much information about Kindoki? What were they trying to achieve? Or was it just to put fear into him so that he would be of good behavior? Or what? I just don't understand why Eric from such a young age was being fed about Kindoki until he became an adult. So throughout their relationship, Magali said that Eric grew more obsessed with sorcery and witchcraft and he began having vivid dreams of his brother trying to harm him like his brother was trying to strangle him in his dreams. So he began to believe that evil spirits were taking over him. So in order to free himself of what he believed to be evil spirits, Eric moved a lot. He constantly changed addresses. He changed apartments around London, trying to, you know, outrun these evil spirits. But this did not seem to work. So he began consulting Nigerian pastors for help. And trust Nigerian pastors and their witchcraft diagnosis. They offered him prayers and solutions. And Eric would pray and pray, but his fears of Kindoki only worsened. He became more and more paranoid. And 
He began to look more into Kindoki and began to do a lot of research on Kindoki on how to identify people with Kindoki. I don't know why that was important to him to identify people that were possessed with Kindoki. So in 2008, a friend of theirs called Naomi Ilonga came to stay with Eric and Magali for a bit and she saw hell in their hands because Eric basically diagnosed her with Kindoki. Naomi, who was only 19 years old at the time, was accused of being possessed due to her biting her nails, which was just some kind of bad habit that she's developed over time. So Naomi stayed for only three days, but within that short stay, Eric would not let her sleep, neither would he let her eat anything or drink anything, no matter how much she, she was hungry and thirsty, he didn't let her take any of those things. Both he and Magli would sit and pray with Naomi for hours and hours on end. Even her hair that was previously very long down to the middle of her back was possibly cut short to release the kindoki out of her. I mean, what has a long hair got to do with witchcraft and kindoki? Imagine a full-grown woman was being tortured like this because Eric felt she was possessed and Magali had to do whatever he wanted because if she didn't do whatever he wanted, she would face consequences. Naomi was trapped with nowhere to go as she was locked up but fortunately for her, she managed to place a call to her mom who came to her aid and she was able to get away but unfortunately for Magali, this resulted in a punishment for her for allowing Naomi to leave and as punishment, Eric forced her to eat off the floor and he beat her severely like he beat her black and blue giving her a black eye. She was so afraid of him so she ran to stay in a woman's refuge for three months. So for three months, Magli stayed away from Eric and for those three months, Eric continued to disturb and pressurize her into coming back to the flat and getting back with him basically. And eventually, Eric's manipulation worked because Magli got back together with him and the boat moved again into Manor House in North London. Mind you, while they were having issues, Magli's family knew that she was out of the flat that she was sharing with Eric. but. When they got back together, the family were not aware. So you can imagine their shock when they got to know that in early 2010, Magali and Eric had gotten engaged. So Eric proposed to Magali and her siblings were excited to come from Paris to London to visit the couple for Christmas. I mean, their sister was engaged and they wanted to spend time with her and her fiancé during the holidays. The plan was that the siblings would spend the Christmas with them. Then the parents that Pierre and Jacqueline will come later after Christmas, maybe on the 26th Boxing Day or 27th. Now, according to Kelly Bamo, who is Magali's 20 years old sister, when they arrived in London, they were well welcomed. I mean, everything seemed normal for the most part during their arrival. And everything pretty much started very well for the first couple of days. But suddenly, things turned weird when Eric and Magali started to you know, talk about their witchcraft and kindoki stuff. They began accusing all five siblings of being possessed with kindoki. According to them, they had brought in kindoki from Paris to their home in London. The siblings were kind of confused about this entire kindoki thing because other than Kelly, all of the siblings were born and raised in Paris. They have never heard of kindoki in their entire life. So they were extremely confused and just didn't understand what exactly the sister and her parents were talking about. All the same, the torture began for the siblings. For days, the siblings were made to pray constantly. I mean, all the time, hour in, hour out. They were refused food and drink. Under no circumstance were they allowed to take even water, no matter how thirsty and hungry they got. The siblings were given a beating and Eric at a point even tried to force them to jump out of the manor house window to see if they could fly. I mean, what sort of delusion was that? Eric really believed his fiancé's siblings were witches that could fly, so he wanted them to fly, basically. Kelly said that no matter how much they begged him to stop torturing them and telling him that they were not witches, he didn't budge. Like, it was clear in his mind. His mind was made up and he did genuinely believe that the siblings had traveled to London all the way from Paris to finish him off just like he had been dreaming about his brother doing to him. So scared and weak from hunger and thirst and sore from the beatings, 
The siblings look up to their 29-year-old sister Magali for help, but she turned a deaf ear and basically allowed her fiancé to carry out, you know, torturing her siblings. I mean, how cruel could she have been? This was the same situation she found herself in and had to run off to a women's shelter for three full months. So yes, she knew what it felt like to be beaten. Yes, she allowed those young children to go through it even more than what she went through. This was someone they look up to for protection and safety. Yes, yeah, she failed them. She had even at some point called her parents on the phone and forced her sister Kelly to tell them what a great time they were having in London while in the recess they were actually being tortured. How wicked can a sibling be? Eventually, Kelly and her 11-year-old sister could not take it anymore, so they just confessed to being witches to avoid the beatings, of course. It was just too much for them to bear, which worked for them, in fact, but for their brother, Christy, it wasn't the same story, unfortunately. So the same night of the sister's confession, Christy couldn't confess to being a witch. He just wasn't a witch, so he wasn't going to confess to being a witch. So he was severely beaten and involuntarily, he wet himself. He was so scared of Eric that he tried to hide his underwear, but once Eric found that underwear, he took this as a sign that Chrissy was the one who brought the kindoki into his house and he began to focus solely on him. So from here on, it was intense and amplified torture for Christy. Eric told the other siblings to join in on the torture being melted out on their brother Christy, but they wouldn't do that voluntarily. So he forced them to restrain Christy while his sister Magali smashed bathroom ties on his back. Like, are you even getting the picture of what they were doing to Christy? How can you smash ties on your sibling's body? because your fiancé says you should do so. Eric and Magali also positioned Christie's hands on a slab and hit it with hammer. They then used sharp kitchen utensils to make cuts all over his body and then used a pair of pliers to mutilate one of his ears. Then Eric used a metal bar, a dumbbell and a chisel to knock out Christie's teeth. I don't understand how knocking out someone's teeth reads the person of evil spirits or demons. This guy, Eric, was the real witch, judging from the things that he did to that young boy. What he did was just straight up hench. So for three and a half days, this torture continued, resulting in about 130 separate injuries from dumbbells, kitchen utensils, chisels, pliers, ties, and anything. And no one did anything to help Christy. His siblings could not, but what a big sister, Magali, what was talking her? On the fourth day, which was now Christmas Eve, December the 24th, Christy was at the verge of shutting down. He was begging and he was pleading for his sister Magali to just let him die. But Magali acted like she didn't see him or hear him in his pain. At this point, Eric began forcing the siblings to clean the red smears from the apartment. I mean, it was on the floors and the walls and furnitures and all the torture instruments were stained with red body fluids. While he was at it, he was also playing loud music and screaming at the siblings on top of his voice. A neighbor of theirs was disturbed by the noise and the commotion, so he made a noise complaint to the building management. So now, the building management sent a handyman to go check out the disturbance. And this handyman returned without going into the apartment to tell the management that he didn't hear anything suspicious. I mean, why did they send a reasonable person? Why does it have to be a handyman? I think it was said that he was a plumber. Why were you sending a plumber to go find out commotion that was going on in an apartment? What happened to the people who worked in the management office? So because of what the plumber said, they didn't get to follow up. Only if they had followed up, maybe Crystal would have still made it. Later that night, Eric made a call to Pierre and Jacqueline telling them that their son Crystal was possessed and if they didn't come to London to get him, he would kill him. Basically, that's what he told his parents. You can imagine hearing this type of a thing as a parent. It shocked them so much they were in disbelief. I mean, this was their daughter's fiancé, right? He was like a son to them even. He wouldn't harm Chrissy, but they began to frantically organize a rental for the six-hour car journey from Paris to London. All the while, they were praying and hoping that nothing happens to Chrissy, but unfortunately for them, it was Christmas and they couldn't get any rental. They had no other option than to painfully wait in agony for the 27 before going to London. 
So while the parents were prepared and waiting, you know, to make this journey from Paris to London, Eric and Magali forced all five siblings into the bathtub and started hosing them down with icy cold water as a cleansing ritual. Basically, they thought that washing them in icy cold water in the winter would cleanse them of Kindoki. This was now towards the end of the almost four days of torture and starvation coupled with the sleep deprivation and more than 130 injuries that was melted and Christy. Christy just couldn't take it anymore at this point. He was mentally checked out and physically his body could not handle any more pain. And as the bathtub filled with water on the 25th of December 2010, his head slipped under the water and that was the end for Christy. Magali noticed within a few minutes that Christy was underwater so she called out to Eric who took him out of the icy cold water and tried to perform CPR on him but it didn't work. Christy was gone. These two both made a decision to call emergency services and when the ambulance arrived, paramedics took Christy to the hospital to try to resuscitate him but he was already gone. At about 8 p.m. that night, Kelly Bamu called her father and informed him that her brother Christy was gone. How sad was that? Pierre was rushing. He was trying so hard to come to his son's aid, but he wasn't fast enough. He didn't do that on purpose. It was because of the festive season. He couldn't get the means to come to London on time. And this is something I believe would torment him for a very long time. As for Eric and Magali, they were arrested and charged with murder and two counts of actual bodily harm. Following their arrest, Eric Bikubi's defense was that he had brain damage and had believed that Christy was a witch. And that was one thing I didn't quite understand. He knew that something was not right with him in the head from the beginning, yet he believed what he wanted to believe about Kindoki and witchcraft and that his fiancé siblings were witches. But now that it has come to facing the consequences of his actions, he suddenly realizes Christy was no longer a witch. What has changed? I mean, was the brain no longer damaged or had it suddenly been fixed since Christy's demise? Well, Eric and Magali both pled guilty to actual bodily harm, like I said, on the grounds of diminished responsibility caused by brain damage, but this was rejected and the case you know, went to jury trial. The jury consisted of seven women and five men. The details they had to sit through and to listen to were so intense that the judge said due to the gruesome nature of the evidence of this horrific crime, they were excused from serving jury duty again. He was exempting them from jury duties for the rest of their lives because of what they have heard and what they have seen. It was just too much. Eric's defense claimed his brain injury, his cultural upbringing and schizophrenia diminished his responsibility for his actions. Why Magali's defense argued she was manipulated as she did not in fact believe in witchcraft and kindoki. But her sister Kelly disagreed. She testified against her sister Magali. She spoke of the lack of remorse from her sister while her and her siblings begged her to stop as she brutally beat and tortured them together. Naomi Ilonga, who had stayed with the couple two years prior to the mother in 2008 and was accused of being possessed due to her biting her nails, the one I talked about earlier, testified as well. She told the court all that was done to her, you know, within the short time that she stayed with them. The details of what Eric and Magali did was so disturbing to listen to. It was just too much to be done to one person. At the end of the day, Eric Bikubi was sentenced to a minimum of 30 years in prison and Magali was sentenced to a minimum of 25 years. The judge told the couple that the case was very sadistic and the believing witchcraft, however genuine, cannot excuse the assault and killing of another human being. Christy's father, Pierre, was as disappointed in his daughter Magli as much as he was hurt for losing his son. He said in a statement, quote, I feel betrayed to know that Christy's own sister Magli did nothing to save him. It makes the pain that much worse, end quote. Portland Yard said it had investigated 83 cases involving abuse resulting from ritualistic or faith-based beliefs over the last 10 years. Remember the boy Adam, the puzzle that was found floating in the Thames, another ritualistic case that remains unsolved to this day. I did a video on it, you can scroll down my videos, you will see Adam's case. Remember, this statement was made over a decade ago, so that figure must have, you know, doubled or even tripled at this point. 
They say that it is a hidden and unreported crime and therefore difficult to deal with in terms of protecting potential victims from harm. This year alone, the UK saw an influx of immigrants from across the globe, especially from Africa and Asia. As more and more people migrate to the UK, a lot of culture and belief will be brought in, including things like kendoki and others that we may never have heard of. We just hope that we hear less of things like what happened to Christy and his siblings. Well, that's pretty much it for today's case, guys. Thank you for watching till the very end. And please consider subscribing to my channel and give this video a thumbs up if this is the type of content that you enjoy. Until next video, please stay safe.